This is the enemy of war. The nemesis of poverty. The killer of things that kill potential. Learning isn't a good thing. It's everything. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Nashville. So for those that joined us last night, uh, it, was a, it was a great evening. Thank you so much for spending time. For those who joined me on South Broadway later, um, I apologize for my enthusiasm, but that's just a warm up act for tonight. So we expect all of you to be with us tonight, but thank you. And uh, again, we, this is really uh, great to have our friends together here for the next couple of days. We appreciate you know, how busy people are, so to spend a couple of days with us, it means a lot to us and we'll respect that. Um, but it's, I, I think the people in this room um, are very special to us. And, you know, in terms of what we're doing, um, we couldn't be more excited about what's going on. So, obviously, it'd be great if the slides worked. Hmm. Good. Um, let me go back. The world seems to be on fire, right? I mean, just a lot going on. It's very, very heavy. And, um, you know, things that uh, may, can make us really fearful. You got, obviously, the conflict in Israel. You have the, the war continuing in Ukraine. You know, we just got COVID behind us where 6.8 million people died. And then we have ongoing issues that, you know, don't go away. You know, 10 million people die this year from hunger. 3 million people die this year uh, from not having clean water. It just, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very scary place um, in the world. Uh, and unfortunately, we are as divided as a country in the United States as we've ever been. And really, it's a global phenomenon. Yeah, just a data point of this, 81% of Americans won't date somebody who's from a different political party. That contrasts with 23% of Americans who won't date someone from a different religion, and 15% of people that won't date somebody from a different race. So what other issues? You know, stricter gun laws, huge divide. Uh, worried about global warning, 87% of Democrats, just 35% of Republicans. Should abortion always be legal? Huge, huge difference. Federal government too powerful, radically different views. Support Obamacare, uh, basically, you know, the, no agreement. Here's something, college students who side with Israel over Hamas, 52% say yes, 48% actually support Hamas. Now you say, I'm making this up, right? Well, this is a Harris poll that came out a couple of days ago, look it up. Um, and again, it's, it just shows just how different people you know, feel about things that are going on. So we can't even agree what day of the week it is. But what's exciting, one issue that we do agree on is about choice and excellence in schools. So about 75% of all Americans believe in, in school choice. 75% support charter schools, uh, ESAs, uh, education savings accounts. Again, huge support for. And you look at historically, you have only 36% of parents who say they're satisfied with the US education system. But the paradox is 76% say they're completely satisfied with their own child's education, right? That was before COVID. Before COVID, that was the way it was. And then what happened? Of course, we had 1.6 billion students got thrown in the deep end of the online learning pool and told to sink or swim. Some sank, some crawled to the edge of the pool, got out, so they're never going back in. Many flail around and basically said, okay, you know, we're kind of getting the hang of this. And you know, the world's never going back. You know, the genie's out of the bottle. But what also happened is parents, because they were home with their kids, seeing what was going on in the classroom, got exposed to um, what was actually happening in their schools. And so after disease, AD, you know, when the mask came on, the mask came off. And so what is that, what happened? He had the, the Virginia election with Terry McAuliffe. He said, I don't think parents should be telling schools what they should teach. That didn't work so well for him. 
and you had Youngkin win that election where a year before Biden had be, won uh, Virginia by 10 points and Youngkin became president on that issue basically alone. So 30 years ago, it doesn't seem that long ago, and you had uh, Ross Perot and George Bush and Bill Clinton on stage, um, but that was, was 30 years ago. And it's in my, with my home people um, in Minnesota, St. Paul, Minnesota was the first charter school that got originated. And so today, there's 7,821 7, charter schools across the United States. We've got Chris Whittle in the room somewhere. And uh, I will tell you that we should all give him a hand because charter schools wouldn't exist, really, the way they have without Chris's leadership. So wherever Chris is, please give him a hand right now. So uh, students enrolled in non-local schools, in other words, schools that aren't your neighborhood public school. It's now 36% up from 10%, which by the way includes private schools. Um, you got 20 million students en enrolled in those type of programs, up 5x from what it was 30 years ago. Virtual charter schools, 691 across the country. You have 32 states that have vouchers or ESA programs. You have 72 different distinct programs. And what's really uh, exciting is the results are starting to speak very loud in terms of what alternatives do for improving outcomes in education. So this was the recent Stanford study that basically showed that charter schools are outperforming traditional public schools, so the free, you know, the invisible hand is working. And what's most exciting is with the most uh, uh, dis disadvantaged children, it's working even better. So giving options to actually change your life through education, which we all believe in, is actually happening in part by having these alternative options for schools. Looking at the money, so a lot of people just say, give, you know, the, basically the trend status quo says, give us more time, give us more money, and we're gonna fix it. And so over the last 30 years, we've given more time and we've given more money. It's uh, now over $16,000 per kid uh, for, for schools. And yet, uh, when you look at the international comparisons, the PISA scores, you know, we're, we're, we've actually fallen in terms of international rankings. So the good news is, back to the, what's happening, the American public has said, you know, 200 years is long enough, we need change today, and change is happening. So look at high school graduation rate, it's an all-time high, 87%, that's good news, I guess. But the bad news is, nearly one in five students that actually graduate from high school can't read. Population of the, uh, of the of US with a college degree, it's 38% up from 25% uh, 30 years ago. And women in college is 60%. So in a knowledge economy, if you want to see the future, who's going to run the world? Women are going to run the world. There's no question about it, you know, if, if, you, if you believe in the knowledge economy, which we, of course, do. Some other issues, because it all is comprehensive. Kids that are overweight, one in five kids are overweight. Kids with depression is 12% of the, of the school population has depression. Teens feeling lonely, uh, 40%. Teens on antidepressants, 37% of teenagers are on antidepressants. Adolescent suicide rate, up 3x in the past 30 years. Drug overdose deaths, we have an epidemic in drug over, in, 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 in opioids. Okay, 105,000 people died last year from opioid over, overdose in the United States. Eli Lilly's market cap in the last 30 years has grown to 555 billion. Dollars. And we could do that again and <clears throat> show you every drug company. It's it exploded. Daily hours that kids spend on media. 30 years ago, it was two and a half hours, and that was basically television. Today, it's eight and a half hours. That's television, that's social media, that's games. Just in 2009, the average person spent 13 hours a, a week on social media. Today, and to social, uh, online. Today, the average person spends 13 hours a day. And here's really something interesting. So when the uh, average kid, when they go from kindergarten to graduate from high school, spend 15,000 hours, 120, 15,120 in a, in a classroom. The average kid today spends 15,000 hours, three, 324 hours playing games. So you can say that's really bad, or you can say that's reality, and what the opportunity is, and one of our big investment themes is invisible learning, 
is can we have students learn by doing things they want to do, which is play games. And we think that's a very exciting opportunity, but it is um, staggering, stunning, to see um, that kind of uh, reality. Also uh, very stunning, 38% of students in America are classified as poor. 45% of the students in K through 12 schools are minorities, so pretty soon the minority is gonna be the majority. Percent of kids born to a single parent, it's 41% in the United States overall today. With black families, it's 78% of the kids born are born to a black parent, or one parent. Hispanic kids, 69%, white kids, 38%. And we all know how important a parent is in terms of a student's learning and, and how they do in school. So the UN had their sustainability goals that they came out with. So there's 17 uh, objectives that they say basically are critical for the future of the world, for the future of society. So no poverty, zero hunger, I mean these are very aspirational, good health and well-being, quality education number four. If you look at every single one of these sustainability goals, if you really think about it, quality education is involved in every single one of them. So if you want to look at this world that's on fire and look at these different issues and challenges facing us, it really boils down to what the people in this room are doing. And the good news is, you know, entrepreneurs solve problems, and there's some amazing entrepreneurs that are coming into this industry to take on these challenges and make the world a better place. Again, back to spending in New York City, it's $38,000 per kid. So just thinking about this, if we got a little bit, we reimagined about how we could create a better system, how we could hit our goal of giving everybody an equal opportunity to participate in the future of the foundation, which is access to quality education. $38,000 per kid spent in public schools in New York City. So just real quick, here's some math. So if you have 20 students in a classroom, that equals $760,000 per class. If the average teacher makes $80,000, and let's just be generous and spend $80,000 on technology, books, and everything else, electricity, whatever anything else you want to spend on, you have over $600,000 remaining. Where does that money go? And the answer is generally, overall, it's, it's consumed by the bureaucracy. So you can't think of another service business that exists in the world where 50 cents of every dollar is spent outside of where the service is being rendered. It doesn't happen. And so that you know, creates opportunity for people that can come up with solutions. For um, 25 years or more, I guess, we've been making an analogy of, to health care and education and saying that we think that if you want to see a roadmap to what the education industry could look like, look at the health care industry because it's kind of 20 years ahead of the education industry in terms of adoption of innovation and technology and, and create market forces that cre create better, better results. Um, and I, think, I still think that analogy is true. Uh, I don't know if we're 20 years behind, I think we're catching up a little bit, but just in comparative purposes, you know, the education market, the healthcare market, $7.8 trillion globally, largest industry in the world. Um, education, $7.2 trillion. The mar public market value of healthcare is $6.6 .6 trillion. Education is $85 billion. So there's a dramatic gap between the public market cap and the overall size of the market. If you look what's going on, on the private side, you can see how that catch up's gonna happen pretty quickly. You have dedicated sector funds in healthcare of 200 plus, and of course people think it's ridiculous. You know, you can't invest in healthcare unless you're a sector expert. You know, we think the same is true of education, but there's only eight sector funds in the world right now that focus on education. You know, GSV Ventures is one of them. If you look at venture capital investment in healthcare, uh, in 2010, it was $7 billion, and education was $500 million. And by the way, we were doing you know, high fives because if you added up all the venture capital that had invested in education technology up until that point, it probably didn't add up to $500 million. But you look today, um, $75 billion, 10x in healthcare, but $11 billion was invested last year in education technology. That was down from $22 billion. Uh, in 21, which had you know, a spike and everything. And the number of unicorns today is roughly you know, one fourth of the number in healthcare. So you're seeing how this catch up is taking place. 
And also what's a reality in the world that we're in is change is happening faster than ever before. So the time to reach 50 million people after a technology is commercialized is speeding up. So airlines, it took 68 years from the first flight to having 50 million passengers on a, on a flight. Telephone, it took 50 years to reach 50 million people. Electricity took 46 years. Uh, computer took 14 years. Cell phone took 12 years. Internet took seven years. Facebook took three years. Twitter took two years. ChatGPT took five weeks. Five weeks. So we think that this is uh, a giga trend, and it changes everything, much like what the internet did 30 years before. Uh, to symbolize this or to kind of reflect this, uh, you may have heard of this, but uh, if you haven't, we're very excited in conjunction with our 15th annual ASU GSV Summit, we're going to have something called the Air Show that goes on a couple days before that's going to be open to the public. And what the Air Show stands for is AI revolution, because we're saying that AI is air. It's invisible, it's ubiquitous, and you need it to live. And we think that's true. So if you, if you don't have an AI component to what you're doing, uh, you, you are going to be left behind at best. So where we're at as a world, human capability is on a linear path. Technology is on an exponential curve, and we're here. So what does this mean? This means that pretty soon the technology is going to replace the technologist. So it's just not blue-collar jobs that are at risk or white-collar jobs. It's no-collar jobs as well. And again, we've seen these different shifts before. 100 years ago, uh, you can almost see that it's 1923. It's beautiful. 30% of the society population was in farming. Today, it's 1%. And so jobs that are going to be replaced is undoubtedly there's a lot of jobs that are going to be replaced. But we, don't think, we think that is an opportunity to advance humanity. And there's certain jobs that are never going to be replaced, such as a nurse providing empathy to a patient. So what I like to say is that a horse that can count to 10 is a remarkable horse, but it's not a remarkable mathematician. And so we think that the, as we look, our, our lens for looking forward is software codifies knowledge. We have that um, AI is going to make that now that is going to make that knowledge intelligent, and then humans are going to be the smart layer on top of it. So software is eating the world. AI is its teeth, but humans decide what to eat. So as my friend Bill Campbell said, when we have facts, we use facts. When we just have opinions, we'll use mine. So the more content is AI generated, the more it becomes a commodity, like an index fund. But the best opportunities will always be on the edge. And that's where humans come in. So good is gone. Great isn't enough. Outstanding is the future. So it's not man versus machine. It's man and machine. So the last 30 years was about revenge of the nerds. You know, the geeks got the girls. The engineers kind of that was, that drove everything. We think the future is back to the future, which is basically having a well-rounded skill set, knowledge base that's going to allow you to adapt to a you know, dynamically changing world. Um, we can't use an old map for the new world. And so the foundational skills that we think are going to reflect in, in a knowledgeable person, a person that's going to see, we call it the seven C's, critical thinking, creativity, communication, cultural fluency, civic engagement, collaboration, character. And so new definitions for old terms. So in the old world, elite equals scarce. Elite doesn't equal scarce. What elite equals is excellence. In the old world, cost was a shortcut to quality. The more expensive it was, the better it was. Well, cost doesn't equal quality. Outcomes equal quality. In the old world, calendar was the progression. So as time went by, you kept on rising. New world, it's mastery. Old world, the school you went to was what created the opportunities for job options. And the more prestigious your school, the better the options that you had. It's not about the school you go to. It's about your competence, what you can do. It used to be your race and gender defined what opportunities were available to you. It's about the content of your character. So as I said before, our North Star from the beginning of GSV has always been and for the ASU GSV Summit is giving everybody deserves an equal opportunity to participate in the future, the foundation of which is access to quality education and knowledge. And so people say that's a pretty ambitious goal, pretty maybe even audacious or ridiculous. Well, we were able to put a person on the moon. 
We're able to create a vaccine in less than a year. We're able to create flying taxis. We're able to send people, we think, to Mars. I promise you, if everybody comes together on this ambition, the people in this room, it doesn't take, we don't need 8 billion people. We need the people in this room to get, keep on getting after it. You know, we can make that difference for all kids so they can all have an opportunity to, to give their God-given uh, place. So we, what we believe investing in is smarts and hearts. You can tell. Um, you can't, somebody's brain, somebody's heart, you don't know what gender they are, we don't know what race they are. We invest in smarts and hearts. And what we believe is creating meaning through learning and purpose through work. And so how, coming, you know, to conclude, Mark Twain said the two most important days of your life are the days you were born and the day you find out why. So that purpose is absolutely the, essential to, we think, create meaning in people's life and what education is about. And so you look at this, you know, people say, I mean, there's no silver bullet in education. There's just, it's too complex. There's too many issues that are gone. It's like a whack-a-mole. You hit one issue down and two more pop up. In some ways, that's true, but I actually do think there's a silver bullet. And that silver bullet is about, hmm, love. If we love our neighbor as we love ourselves, and that's the, that's the lens that we use, we can make this happen. If, we, if you cared about your neighbor's kid as much as you care about your own kid, we can, we can change the world. And you say, well, that sounds pretty Christian. Well, actually, the Old Testament, love your neighbor as yourself, Leviticus, that's the, that's the Hebrew faith. Love your neighbor as yourself, there's no commandment greater than this, that's the Christian faith. If you look at Islam, not one of you truly believes until you wish for others which, which you wish for yourself. And then the Hindu faith, this is the sum of duty. Do, no, do unto others which you would cause your pain if done to you. So I think our solution is based <laughs> on uh, the great religions of the world. So we say make your dash count. We have dash me, which I'd love for you all to sign up for if you haven't, which is our newsletter. It gives us insights in the innovation economy. But with that, I hope you, we all have a, a great two days. And again, thank you so much for being part of this.